it must be that IT buzz, you know. Or, you know, computers don't work till I touch them, you know. You got it. It's yeah. Well, it depends what time it is. Yeah. 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 Um, anyone want to open us up in prayer? All right. Thanks. Amen. Okay, so we were talking about Proverbs 13, right? Going through it. Making pretty good progress, I think. Um, we left off on verse 7. And it says, One person pretends to be rich but has nothing. Another pretends to be poor but has great wealth. And I left off with the phrase, Hood rich, 24 inches is a pretty low throne. I actually meditated on this quite a bit because this is a, a culture problem, especially in America. And again, it's, it, the Proverbs, it's one of those things where you never feel like you're on the bad side of things. You always read it and you're like, "Woo, that's not me. And then when you really start to think about it, you realize, now you might not be 100% in it, but you're still in there. So wealth, if we look it up in the dictionary, I'm sure we all know what it is. It's the abundance of valuable possession or money. Not just having some money, it's the abundance of it. I think a lot of times we think we're wealthy. I think there's a lot of people that we think are wealthy that aren't. A real wealthy person is someone that doesn't have to work for a living. If someone has a job, they're not wealthy. We're under the impression that they are. Someone makes a million dollars salary, we're like, person's rich. But in reality, it's, it's a fake richness, which was actually kind of neat because why would someone that makes a million dollars pretend to be rich? By our standards, they are rich, right? But yet, if you actually look at it statistically, they don't own their own home. They're still making payments. They don't own cars. They're making payments. They don't own the boats. They're making payments. But we put value on that somehow. Like, we see it. We see the outward appearance. And we're like, well, I don't have a boat. They're doing better than me. I don't have a brand new Beamer every year. They're doing better than me. And, that, and that's, how we, that's how we judge people. And we also judge them by their power. You know, some of the most powerful people that run companies, they get fired all the time because they do terrible jobs. <laughs> but yet we think that they have some kind of wealth that we don't have. And we kind, of, we kind of emulate their wealth with with what we have, if that makes sense. We don't really know a wealthy person. As far as I know, I don't know anyone that's like really wealthy. That like just doesn't have to work. The richest people I know make millions of dollars. They still go to work every day. They want me to come fix their computer. Oh, we got to come on Saturday. I'm working. Okay. Maybe their wives get to go out and spend the money. You know, maybe the wives are the wealthy ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Okay. So when we step back and we look at wealth being the abundance of valuable possessions or money, if you don't own your possessions, they're not your possessions. They're just somebody else's. You're, in all reality, you're renting, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. But don't, confu you know, don't think to yourself that you're rich. You know? And then sometimes when you think about it, and, and I talked to Nikita's sleep, but that's fine. I talk about it. It's like some things you just look at. Like you, you drive down Holyoke. You see all the engineering that went into making some of those mills. And that was a busy place, making paper and all that. Now it's an eyesore. Nobody wants it. it they want it to burn down. They want it to tear it down. All that profit and all that 
energy that went into it is completely useless. But it might have made someone a great wealth for that time. So when we take a look at this, we start to realize, and it's because of the American culture, that we think that we're rich, but we only have these things for a limited time. You buy the nicest house, you don't touch it, you don't do any maintenance to it, 18 months start to break down. You buy a car, you drive it off the lot, we know that. Its value is, it's gone. Somebody hits you, you don't have the right insurance, you now owe money on a car that you drove for a few hours. <laughs> but yet, when we get it, we think like we, we achieve something, you know? We think that, yeah, we've got some kind of status. But then when we're all in the same boat, what's the status? I got a bigger car payment? That doesn't seem like a game I want to win. In all reality, all we own are paper slips. And it's usually got someone's name on the lien. Sometimes I like to imagine like what it would be like if like an alien came down just to look at our culture. <laughs> and when you really think about how ridiculous some stuff is, it's quite comical. You go to work, you do something. I look at computers, I type, click a couple things. You know, I'm not building houses, I'm just clicking things. At the end of the week, I get a piece of paper. I take it to a bank, they click a couple things, and either I just get numbers, or they give me more paper. <laughs> you could trade that paper in for food, you could pay some bills. The bills are paper, so it's just a paper exchange. There's really no value, there's no wealth, there's no, there's no possession. You're just shuffling around paper. And the funny thing is, is, you know, historically, we've seen what happens when paper loses its value. We've all seen pictures of people trying to buy bread with a wheelchair, uh, wheelbarrow full of money. Yeah. Right? We're not far off from that. Yeah. Right. However, we're riding around in our cars like, yeah, life's good, you know? One step, you know, one catastrophe away, you have nothing. What's going to save you? The FDIC is going to save you? You know, they guaranteed your deposit? Sweet. And not that I know what a solution is, it's just to kind of look at this. One person pretends to be rich but has nothing. If our dollar was worth nothing, what would you have? Nothing. Paper. Full of paper. If there was some kind of baking disaster, you know, um, we see things like Target, people steal identities and things like that. Something like that happens, wipes out your account. What do you have? Nothing. Sometimes I think it's better to have no money than a bunch of money. If you have no money and a bill comes in, you don't have to budget. You're just like, nope. <laughs> right? <laughs> but at the same time, I mean, if you have you know, stock portfolios and things like that, that starts to consume you. You're looking because you don't want to lose that money. You want to, you know, the stock market crashes, okay, you want within three years to get that money back. You're doing all these things where in all reality, they're just numbers in a computer. And again, using like the alien analogy, if you were to come down, an alien has no source of reference, right? If you're just a brand new person, those numbers don't mean anything. What's, what's the difference between that and a video game? What's the difference between that and going to the casino? I, I know that's stretching things, but in all reality, when you think about it, there's no difference. There's no wealth there. If there was wealth there, everyone wouldn't be doing it. Somebody's making money, but it's not you. So the basic thought is that things can't be judged by their outward appearance.
We know as Christians, the Bible tells us, to in order to become wealthy, we have to give to others. When we start to understand that our money isn't the wealth, then we can understand that. If money's gone, what's left? Nothing, really. In that, in that aspect. But you'll still have friends. You still have family. That doesn't go away, right? You can't just go, hey, listen, uh, we're not friends anymore because I don't have any money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's some times where it, when you have money, people are just around. And then there's other times when you don't have money, those people disappear. You know? So how does a person pretend to be poor but have great wealth? Why would someone pretend to be poor? Have you ever seen anyone pretend to be poor? Yeah. <laughs> usually, we know, we know that this is in Proverbs. So if it says someone pretends to be poor that has great wealth, it's usually a good thing. It's not a bad thing, right? But the only people that I know that have ever pretended to be poor, we're trying to work the system. Oh, the, the only people that I know that are pretended to be poor that were wealthy were trying to work the system. There's some kind of scam going on. Um, you know, they collect money or they claim children that aren't their own. You know, you know, in a way to have fake wealth. And wealth meaning you don't have to work. If you don't have to work and people pay your bills, you're wealthy. Yep. We're, the only time in the Bible that I can remember that someone was wealthy that didn't want people to know, and this kind of goes into the next scripture, was in Genesis. Genesis 12, 13. Say you're my sister so that, we, so that it may go well with you so that I may keep my life. Did you want to say something? Sure. Okay. Ready for it? Sure. I know you said also as far as people... Um, pretending to be poor when they have wealth or trying to work the system. But actually, I grew up in an environment where it was actually the church that people wanted to pretend they had nothing because they felt that was a, a sense of humility. Mm -hmm. They said they, they wanted to express that, the humility around them. So they, they go around with the whole woe is me thing. I have nothing. This world has nothing for me, so on and so forth. And that's a demented church mentality. We all know that. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's just as demented as going around saying, I got all this money in the world, and when you don't. Right. But I, that, I grew up in a church system that expressed that abundantly of how, oh, we've got nothing here. We, you know, so they're not trying to work the system. It's just that, that fake humility that they're trying to express where they don't, for whatever reason. But that's a, that's, a, that's a rampant thing that happens in the church mm -hmm. that we have to be aware of. <laughs> I was going to say something about the same thing, but uh, Travis brought it up. So uh, we, we've come through a season. And I think we we always do this in the in the body of Christ. It's uh, we come through these cyclical things, and uh, I think there was a hundred years or so when it the poorer you looked, the poorer you acted, the poorer you were, the more holy you were. And if you had, if you went out and bought a new car, everybody questioned where you got the money and and. Travis will understand what I'm trying to say. But the bottom line is, whether we like it or not, I don't care what you have. I don't care what you get. If we don't put on life, I don't care whether you're the greatest Christian, we can talk about dying and going to cloud of witnesses, or whatever, whatever you want to you wanna put to it. 
the bottom line is whatever you gather here, sooner or later you can't take it with you to the other side. Now, there's nothing wrong with having things. There's nothing wrong with enjoying things unless the Lord says to you, you can't have that. That's the real key. I, I see no, no ex reason for us to go back to the old system where, where um, you, you acted like you were so poor, you were dirt poor, you know, and, and all that stuff, you know, that we, we think about. But the bottom line is we got to come to a place where we walk in balance with the Lord. I said to Sister Fran this morning, whether we like it or not, if out of God we came, the spirits of men returned to the God that gave them, okay. If out of God we came, and Acts 17 is a reality that he knows and he set us in the time slot we live in, he knew exactly what our circumstances around us were going to be like. Why didn't he set you 100 years ago or 200 years into the future, it's because he knew that exactly at this time there was going to be a change. People all want to be wealthy. Everybody's wanting to get ahead, okay? A lot of times at the expense of others, you know. Um, I don't know who it was. I guess it was Andy said to me on Thursday. He said, we got a new general manager, and his first statement to all the employees was, I'm going to the top, and if you get on my side, you can go with me, but if not, well, I understand those tongues. That means just don't get in my way, or I'm going to step on you. And that's the attitude that happens when we're not careful. We have it in the church. I've got the greatest revelation in the world. Look out. So... Wealth is not measured by tangible things. Wealth is measured by the character that's inside of an individual. I, I, I may, I, let me say this, and I'm, I'll shut up. <laughs> God will give you just as much money as he can trust you with. I remember... Uh when I was in, I think I was like 18 or 19, I had a job where I would travel around the country uh, for Best Buy, uh, setting up new stores and displays and things like that. And uh, we made pretty good money. I think it was like 21 bucks an hour. This is back in like 2002, 2003, so it was decent money. And we all worked on a project team. So we were all a team, the same people would travel, we're all from different parts of New England, but we'd all travel together. And one of the really cool things about working there was every day that you weren't home, they gave you a per diem, which was about 50 bucks a day on top of your normal pay. And a project would take about three weeks, so you'd get that money as soon as the plane landed and you checked in. You'd get a big check. And it would always be funny because you'd see people going out to like super expensive steak restaurants and just blowing all this money, buying coats and things like that. And like towards the end of the projects, they're asking to borrow a couple of bucks, you know? And you see them like, uh, all of a sudden, the, uh, the free breakfast at the hotel is the most delicious thing, you know? <laughs> Where before they were saying, oh, I'll never eat here. This place is disgusting. So what I always kind of thought, and going back to this, is that we live in like a cash flow type thing. Your wants, needs, and opinions of something will change depending on how big your cash flow is. There's things that are beneath you when you have a certain amount of money that all of a sudden would be a blessing when that money shrinks down. I'm not going to scrub a toilet. I'm IT. Okay. Well, if all there is is janitor jobs, you're not an IT manager if you don't have a job, you know? Yeah. And reading this, reading this, what, what really kind of, I hate to like speak frankly, but what kind of sucks is like when you see this in you, you know, when you look back and you see these attitudes where it's like, I don't think of myself rich at all. But then when you look back and you're just like, okay, well, I don't have abundance of things, but there's nothing I lack, you right? You know, there's nothing that's like, oh, I haven't eaten in four days. What's going on? 
There's nothing like, I can't buy gas to get to work. I don't have that problem. All right. Okay, so someone that pretends to be poor that has great wealth. Now, I didn't take it as the pride thing, because this hooks up later when we talk with pride, but this is, all this is learned behavior, and I started off talking about the culture. It's all learned behavior. You know, we have a problem, and it's easy to bash America, but we have a problem where people want to spend less money at Walmart so that we don't care where the stuff's made. If you were to take an iPhone from brand new today and go back 10 years and show someone, people would think it would cost millions of dollars. Now it's 100 bucks. And if it ever went up to $120 because it wasn't made by slaves, nobody would buy it because it used to be 100 bucks. It's very interesting now to like look back. We know about inflation and all this stuff, and we look back. Things are a lot cheaper now than they ever were when I was a kid. You know, the only thing that was cheaper when I was a kid that I could think of is gas. You know, and that's how you know you're getting old when you can be like, I remember when gas was, you know. <laughs> yeah, I remember when my mom was saying that. I'm like, yeah, okay, mom, just pay the pay the bill, you know. But, it, but it's true. It's, everything nowadays is so cheap that there, even if you were to judge your wealth based on what you buy, the quality of what you can buy nowadays is so bad, you don't even really want it. It's designed to, to fail. You know, one of my first cell phones was a Nokia. I bet if I still had it, it would still work. That thing was a brick. It was a tank. It was dropped in the toilet, dropped <laughs> on concrete floor. I actually... Uh, one time, is Savani here? I gave it to Savani, and she lost it. Yeah, that's not a surprise. But the amazing thing was, is I found it in the spring when the snowbank melted, and it still worked. The battery was still charged, too. It was a good phone. At that point, I didn't want it up to my face anymore, you know, so. Right. <laughs> But it's, it's interesting because anything you buy nowadays changes. You know, you buy a Nintendo system back in the day, that thing would still work today, exactly as it did brand new. Yeah. You buy an Xbox, that thing has updates every week. Yeah. And sometimes they take features out that you bought it for. Oh, you wanted to watch movies? We don't do that anymore. Now you have to rent them. So, and, and just talking about this is just to show how foolish we are to put value into things. Yeah. A big screen TV, good job. They're coming out with 4K now, so that 1080p, piece of junk. Yeah, yeah. it costs you money to, to throw it away. Now, how many times have you taken something to get fixed, and they're like, eh, you're better off just buying a new one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much everything. Like, even cars are getting to that point, you know? Or it's like, oh, this is going to cost you like a 1000 bucks. You might as well just put that in a down payment. It will lower your bills, you know? It's crazy to think of it. We don't fix anything. So why do we put value in possessions? They... There's a, there's a thing, they have this thing called buyer's remorse. That's sad that that's a real thing. Do you think anyone's ever had that in the old days when they got like sheep? They're like, oh man, we should not have gotten those sheep. <laughs> Can't believe we bought that cow. Now we have milk. I'm going to have to go out there every morning and milk it. That's crazy. I can't do this. Nobody has that, right? But you have that when you buy the TV and the new version comes out two weeks later. Oh, I should have just waited. <laughs> right, right. So when I see another person pretends to be poor but has great wealth, I read that as some person that's trying to hide their wealth. Why would, why would someone try to hide their wealth? Either to fit in, or if you go to the next scripture, the ransom of a man's life is his riches. But the poor heareth not rebuke. 
Now, I've never seen a poor person get kidnapped and held for a ransom. Growing up in Holyoke, people got you know, robbed all the time for their sneakers. You buy brand new Air Jordans and you're a white boy, those are not your possession. No one ever stole my $20 sneakers from Kmart. They weren't a hot commodity. Could have been foot order, you know, I don't know. The poor are not exposed to any threats or envy affecting the safety of their lives. They're not a threat. Like it or not, we compare, compare ourselves to each other. We shouldn't, but we do. Someone gets a new car, all of a sudden it starts to spread. This person gets a new car, this person gets a new car. This, did everyone's car break at the same time? Was there a massive pileup? No. My buddy Camiar makes decent money. They have the same problem. Everyone buys a new BMW. Everyone else has to have a new BMW. I'm sure the BMW sales guys love that, but it's always in spurts, right? It's not like one person gets it and everyone doesn't care, right? They all go out in the parking lot, check it out. Oh, that's cool. Oh, they got this now, heated and cooled steering wheel. Oh, I hate in the summer when I have to wait for the AC to cool it. But we compare ourselves to each other at every step, and that's a culture thing. Whether you're rich or you live in the ghetto. In the ghetto, you can only afford an old Honda Civic, but you'll hook it up. You'll put some rims on it. You'll put a stereo on it. You'll put speakers that should be inside a house on it. <laughs> and it'll look so bad you won't even realize. But that's your measurement of value. You're that much better than the person that didn't do that. You can't really change up your house when you live in the ghetto because everyone lives in the same apartment buildings. But you can have a brand new TV. You can have the PlayStation 4 the day it comes out. Or now what's crazy is you can have the new iPad, the new iPhone, all this stuff. And you'll spend rent money on it. You'll skip certain payments to get it because it's a status symbol. And it's not just the ghetto, we have that here. We have, we have that problem too. But the ransom of a man's life are his riches. Is someone going to kidnap you to hear about God? You would hope so. In China, right? They'll kill you. Did they say, hey, did you buy that iPhone? Yeah. Mm -mm. Off of your head. Were you talking about Jesus? Were you talking about Christ? We don't do that here. It's kind of sad when, when people think about us, they usually go by what you got. And I've never, ever heard anyone brag about how much scripture someone else knows, other than maybe being in the church. I've never gone to work and be like, that guy knows scripture. Right? It's not like that. It'll be like, oh, they just bought a new house or they got a new car, something like that. They got a raise. You know, it's never like, wow, that person did an awesome study on Revelations. Like, it was just amazing. That rarely happens. We don't really have that type of keeping up with the Joneses in the church. We're fake rich in that. We may know a scripture or something like that but we don't really study it out. We'll pretend. I've done it. We're like, oh, you're this Christian. Like, oh, yeah, that's in New Testament. <laughs> right? We don't know it. But I wouldn't want you guys to think that I was poor in spirit or poor in knowledge. So I'm going to fake it. I'm going to throw some rims on it. So Proverbs 13, 8, again, man's ransom, the ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. 
So this brought me to Genesis, which we, I quoted before. Say you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life will be spared for your sake. I can understand that, right? You know, you, you, you drive down downtown Springfield with your windows down at 2 o'clock in the morning with money sitting on the seat. You're asking for trouble. You roll into town with a beautiful woman on your arm. You might be asking for trouble. In this case, when, something, when God gives you a blessing, sometimes other people see it. Sometimes it means something else to them. In this case, when Abraham did this, he almost got himself killed for doing it this way too. I find in my, in my own thoughts, I never assume someone's a Christian. I assume they're not. That's my default. When I go for a job, when I went for my job now, it turns out that they're very devout Christians. They asked me a question during the interview, what's the one thing I hate the most? And I said, lying. And then they go, well, is it ever okay to lie? In the business, the answer is always yes. Like, but you, I don't like to lie. So I'm like, no, it's never okay to lie. However, you know, you could plead the fifth. You don't have to give out information that makes you look bad when you're self, you know, self-judging yourself. Well, it turns out that's one of the reasons why I got hired was because of that. I didn't know that they were a Christian. I just assumed they weren't. Abraham had the same thing. Now, there wasn't Christian, but he was a God-fearing man. He's like, what are you trying to do to me? Why did you say it was your sister? Like, are you trying to get me in trouble? You know? Or it's, a lot of times, I, that's how I, I feel. I feel like the person I'm talking to, unless I know they're a Christian, they're heathen. And I'm starting to realize we shouldn't do So, like this week at work, uh, every Monday or Tuesday, we have like a prayer sh- session at work. And it always seems to happen that we have some kind of vendor meeting at that same exact time. So, I remember being a new Christian and coming to church and thinking everyone's crazy. Because from that, you know, mindset, you are. We are. So when I see someone coming in trying to sell us something... And my boss is like, oh, we have prayer time for the next hour. You're welcome to join us. I feel bad for that person. Because he's like, uh, you, know, you can see it. You know, you can see like the, they want to say no, right? They're like, uh, you, that, you know, I, I like to read a couple of scriptures a day. I'm like, really? What's your favorite book? I like the middle ones, you know? <laughs> but then, a couple of times I've been surprised, where after we'll watch a, we basically watch a church service for an hour, and then we'll pray at the end. A couple of times I've been surprised by some vendors actually know more about the topic than the preacher did. And at the end was like, oh, you know, this is, you know, at my church we were talking about this, this, here's some scriptures that were helpful. And you're just like, what the heck? Like, like, what are you selling? You're selling a pump? Like, So I guess to wrap it up, because that's the first bell, to wrap it up, what this is about is two things. Judging things by outside appearance. One thing that I'm struggling with and I'm trying to fix is that assuming everyone's heathen. I have no way to know. I just assume that they are. Unless I see... I don't even know. You could have a cross necklace. That doesn't mean anything. Right? 50 Cent has one, but he's not, you know, spitting scripture. That doesn't mean anything. You know, they think that they, they're struggling through something like Jesus, so that's how they, you know, relate. But we judge people based on their riches, what we consider riches. If you had the mindset of 20 years from now, right, and had that now, you would be laughing so hard at people. 
Like, anyone look at a picture from the 80s and be like, wow, that was stylish? <laughs> right? Uh, all the time? Yeah, denial. <laughs> but it's true. We all have all sorts of things that are just, like, brown cars why, with wood on it. Why? <laughs> you know? That doesn't, but that, that was an option. You paid extra for that. We're all doing that now and not realizing it. You know, marketing is so good that they can, they can sway your opinion on whether something should be made out of plastic or metal just by the way they pitch it. What's better? Oh, this year it's plastic. Oh, it lasts long. No, it's metal because it's, you know, it's more firm. It doesn't flex. When, it doesn't matter. You're not going to use that phone five years from now. You're not going to use that computer five years from now. I think for this, and I can only speak for myself, is I need to really, really consider what are the riches? What is the wealth? And how to increase it and how to give it to people. Because in this, even if you have the richest things, it's a threat to your life, even naturally. You have to protect it. Or that that item becomes so desirable that someone will kill you for it. You know, there's things that you hear, you know, someone spills soda on someone's shoe and they get shot. The amount to pay the surgeon to pull the bullet out costs like 900 times more than those sneakers. So why do we put great value on things that we know don't last? I don't see any cars out there from the 80s. A couple from the 90s. You know where the rest of them are? In the junkyard, where they belong. Right? It's, it's hard because it's hard on me. You read it and you're just like, th these are just simple little things, you know? The person that pretends to be rich has nothing. I had to, take, I had to reevaluate. I have nothing. If you were to take the dollar away, the few that I have, the only thing I have is who I am. And sometimes who I am, I keep for myself. And I've, I've talked about this before. I'll say I'm busy. Hey, can you fix my computer? Uh, you might get it back in six months. Why? I'm busy playing on my tablet. That's going to be obsolete next year that I'll buy another one. I was busy watching Netflix. I was putting value into something that is so temporary, it even ha it has an end point, a movie. How many movies did we watch this week? I've watched more than one. Did I watch more TV than I put into this Sunday school lesson? Luckily, I got convicted before that happened. <laughs> so it was about 50-50. But it was possible. There's one thought that I always had that I always thought it was interesting. And pastor, please, wherever you went, correct me if I'm wrong. But in all reality, if you look at just the basic numbers of things, if you put in just your 10%, not money, just 10% of your effort and time, you would fulfill all of God wanted from you. That's less than a minute, an hour. I guess we'll just stop there.